Okay, so um, everybody hear me okay? Great, okay. Um, first of all, thank you to Lynn and to Will and to the Schoenberg Center for having us all here. And then thank you to everybody who's presented over the last two days. This has been an invigorating couple of days and thinking about what's next is really reflecting on what's been happening here over the last couple of days. So thank you um, very much. Uh, Will gave me five minutes to talk about linked data and manuscripts and then cut it back to three. So I'm gonna move quickly here. Um, I think I was invited here because I've been involved in IIIF uh, since the beginning. So I wanted to just remind the room what IIIF is and why we talk about it in a linked data context. Uh, first of all, IIIF is an image API for transporting pixels back and forth. That's not necessarily the linked data part, though it does uh, make use of material that's out there. The linked data part is built on a data model called the Web Annotation Data Model which is a way of linking two different uh, resources, web-based resources. And so after a morning of seeing wonderfully complex data models, I figured I would just end the day with the easiest one that's out there. Um, all you have to have is a target, a body, and some way of linking the two in a relationship. Um, on that is built a concept for talking about books and other text-bearing objects, images, and things like that. Uh, which is the shared canvas data model. On the left-hand side, you see there, the shared canvas is a contextual space upon which everything else is mapped by web annotations. Could be images being mapped onto that conceptual space, descriptions, transcriptions, translations, comments, et cetera. Uh, and then IIIF leads to a slightly more complex uh, data model on the side uh, describing the structure of an object. Uh, so that's IIIF in a nutshell. Uh, that's one minute down, I believe. And then what I wanted to talk about a little bit is what you can do with IIIF and why we like to think of it as a scaffolding for linked data projects. It's not a linked data ontology the way that we've seen with some of the earlier projects today. Rather, it's a way of putting material together. So on this page, you see a marked up annotated page from the Vatican. Uh, they've spent the last three years creating a new project to guide people through their largely uncatalogued collection of 80,000 manuscripts. Uh, and what they're trying to do is find ways of inviting people in while the catalog descriptions are being built out. And so what you see here is a set of um, annotations that are transcriptions, transcriptions of uh, paratext, descriptions of endings of words, uh, and then descriptions of the whole page. And that's very flattened in this UI. So I'm thinking a little bit about uh, what Lynn was saying earlier about being aware of sort of the iceberg of information that lies underneath. So for every one of these annotations, there's an entire graph of knowledge that hides underneath it. And so what we have there uh, in the top left is that image we were looking at, that page, and then all of the individual annotations created by different people of different types that sit underneath that. And that's an important thing to remember as we start moving forward, is that we will want to be able to filter that, we will want to be able to credit that information, pull it out in different ways so that people can work with it, uh, outside of any individual UI, because those UIs are only gonna last two or three years at tops. So as I started to think about looking ahead, I wanted to be a bit of a Cassandra. Um, as we saw with Jeffrey Witt, 750,000 annotations hit us very hard uh, when we're coming at it from the publishing, preservation, and library point of view. Um, so his work is the work of a lifetime, Lifetimes are finite. How do we handle this data as lifetimes start uh, moving on? Uh, so how do we preserve <laughs> access? How do we preserve access to the resources themselves in, a, in the long term? More importantly, how do we preserve the relationships between those resources as platforms change, as the web changes? How do we credit observations, insights, contributions, so the questions of authorship, multivocality, multi um, mm, hidden work and things like that can be brought forward. And I just wanna use the last 10 seconds of my time saying that this is really a publishing preservation and library problem that we are ill-equipped to deal with right now. Uh, and seeing projects like we've seen over the last couple of days really gives us a sense, I think, of what we're up against in the future. So thank you, that's my Three minutes? So as Bill said, I founded the codices. I'm leading this project since 16 years. And uh, 
the aim of this project is to digitize all manuscripts in Switzerland. Of the medieval manuscripts, we have meanwhile made about 25%. So since uh, four years, I'm leading another project, which is an international project on map manuscript fragments. Uh, and we also have some projects here in America, but uh, meanwhile, on every continent. What um, is probably also something that, uh, well, started somehow here in Schoenberg in discussions we had in the advisory board of the Schoenberg database of manuscripts is the need to have an international standard manuscript identifier, a project that I'm leading together, together now with the state uh, library in Munich, the Bavarian State Library, and the IRASTE. Here, the aim is to attribute an ID to a manuscript, to a real object, which is much more than just a shelf mark, because shelf marks are not really sufficient in the digital world and uh, for digital libraries, because an object, a manuscript cop object is much more uh, complicated. It has a history, it moves, etc., uh, and uh, it has fragments, it has palimpsests, and for this, we try to develop a linked data model. So Bill asked me to talk uh, about descriptions and uh, during the conference, I had several different discussions with participants, and I just wanted to explain an idea I, I had and something we are working on. So digital manuscript libraries uh, use descriptions, but usually the descriptions you have in digital libraries are not very good. They are very often inferior to the printed catalogs. So if you just look at the best digital libraries in the world, like Heidelberg, uh, Handschriften Digital, they um, have a nice interface. They have good images, you, but the search is not very good. And if it goes to the descriptions, the scientific descriptions, they just have PDFs. The same with Gallica. I think uh, the search is not excellent, and the descriptions are very basic. So I find it quite insufficient if um, you have very good scholarly descriptions and they are not used for the online presentation. If you would like to look far, you should be a little like dwarfs on the shoulder of giants. But you have to climb the shoulder of giants to see far. And <clears throat> what I think, um, we can naturally use and tag manuscripts with PI. And with ecodices, we do it. We tag, tag it carefully with descriptions. And we have already tagged several hundred thousand tags to make PI descriptions. But in a way, I think also this solution is for me insufficient. These descriptions we have on the internet are very wooden. And they just um, are a copy of the printed catalogs. They don't, they don't go far. And what I try to do and what I would like to give as an idea for the next steps is to make real digital descriptions, not just copy of printed uh, catalogs. But uh, to explain it, I, I have to use a comparison. So I loved maps, big maps. And I was very good in map reading. But uh, today, digital maps or a GPS is very different and most useful. And I don't need any more so much the traditional maps. Or newspapers, I was used during 40 years to read newspapers, but now I switch to digital. But the digital newspapers or the digital maps are today something different from the tr traditional maps. They developed maybe at the beginning the word PDFs. Now, I think the form is completely different. So I think we have to do something similar for descriptions, something like a GPS for manuscripts. What we try to do next in ecodices is 
not only to display the TEI descriptions online and to make it searchable, but to integrate all the metadata of the descriptions in the AAA app manager's file. So that it is searchable and that all information you have with the manuscripts belong together. We call this internally the project wrapping. <laughs> a wrapping is a collection of wraps whose tails are intertwined and bound together by one of several possible mechanisms. So, um, we are still at the beginning, but maybe, you know, we have something in the future like a GPS for manuscripts or really an operation wrapping. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am, to nobody's surprise whatsoever, I'm going to talk about bibliophilies. And then if I have, a, if I have time, if I have time after, I, I want to mention a project I'm working on that bibliophily helps make possible. So if you don't already know, Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis is um, what it has been a three-year grant-funded project funded by the Council on Library and Information Resources to digitize most of the Western medieval manuscripts in the Philadelphia area. Uh, we just, um, oh, I should say, so um, I was a co-PI on the project. The project was led by um, Lois Black, who is at Lehigh University, and the third co-PI was um, Janine Pollock at the Free Library. So this was a very um, collaborative project. I think looking into the future, collaboration, as we've seen, I think in a lot of the presentations, um, is going to be a big is going to be a thing that's going to take us forward. People working together to make these projects happen. Um, it involved 15 institutions, including the R3 institutions, and we ended up digitizing 475 codices. And um, the project also includes uh, several thousand leaves and cuttings. Most of those are from the Free Library and had actually already been photographed and described. So we just sort of took this existing uh, digital data and sort of pulled it into the project. But most of the codices work um, was, was new for the project. So what we're looking at here is a screenshot of the final interface. So this was sort of, when we say bibliophily, this is what we present in the world, um, to the world. But what's behind the scenes is open which um, I was told not to talk about because Will said he was going to talk about open. So I will just say that this is where we hold the manuscript descriptions, which are TEI XML, and the high resolution digital images that um, actually sort of undergird this. This is just a little piece of code that pulls from open. Um, and we can replace it in a few years if we want to, which we probably will because that's the way web tech works, right? There's always, um, changing. So I just want to show you a little bit of how, how this looks. Um, you can come, because we used keywords in our, um, in our data, you can come in and select by keyword what you want. So this is a book of hours. This is the 15th century book of hours. There are 73 of them in the whole collection. Um, this is a book of hours, use of Rowan. Um, and you can see that because we have um, described all of the uh, texts that are in here and that we have the decorations and we know where they are. You can actually come in and see very clearly um, through this interface the order of the texts. And um, here is the calendar. If you look up at the top left, the little icon with the eye is the information. That's what we're looking at now. Next to that is a little thing that is kind of looks like some booklets stacked together. What could that be? It's collation. So one of the things that we were able to do with Bibliophily that I'm really excited about is we actually um, integrated VizCall, which is another project that I've been working on for years to model and visualize the physical co collation of manuscripts. And we actually integrated into this interface. So what you see here is the choir structure. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but they're Underneath each of the Q numbers, those are the, obviously the choirs, you've got the, um, the construction there, how many leaves there are in each one. And then if you select one, this is choir 10. We can see choir 10 is um, folio 70 through 77. And you can see there how the bifolia are, are, um, are connected to each other. And if you click one of, any one of those little pairs of images, you get the bifolia. 
So what we're looking at here is 77 verso on the left and 70 recto on the right. So that is the um, interior view of the outer bifolia of choir 10 in this manuscript. Um, so that is that. The next thing that we're looking to do with um, VizCall is actually to start doing more with linking the information about the contents of manuscripts with the physical construction. So this is obviously a, like a mock-up, um, but what we have here is a diagram of um, MS5, that's the same manuscript we were just looking at. So here is a different kind of diagram. And then you can see that I've sort of put off to the side. Here are the, the texts and the illustrations that are on these, um, on these choirs. And the reason that that's important is then you can see there's, there's an inserted leaf. The reason that re leaf is inserted is because there's a miniature on it. Um, and you can see where the texts begin and end through the book and that can sort of help you know about how it was originally constructed and also if there were changes in the um, in the future of the of that book you can see how they were made do I is that my time up okay <laughs> thank you so um, uh, first I just want to say that it's really wonderful to be here at this conference um, it's such a privilege and it's a bit daunting to be among this group of colleagues uh, who are really at the cutting edge of discussions about archives collections manuscripts um, and their digital lives so thank you so much Lynn for the uh, kind invitation to uh, participate in this uh, event and so um, as Will mentioned um, I'm here I think because of my recent work um, that is really uh, asking about the pressured stakes of digitization in times of war and precarity. Um, also thinking about the responsibilities of scholars who are entangled with objects, uh, material and digital, um, that have become instrumentalized in a moment when cultural heritage is extremely divisive. So we're going to be shifting gears a great deal here, but I hope that this will add something to our discussion. Um, so uh, this work that I've been doing lately has been focused on um, a project called the Yemeni Manuscript Digitization Initiative, or YIMDI. Um, and I was not involved with this project at all. I simply have been looking at it and analyzing it and trying to historicize it. It's a very recent project, but still I think it requires some discussion. And this was an international project that was funded by an NEH and a Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft Enriching Digital Collections Grant from 2011 to 2013. And the goal was to digitize a corpus of manuscripts held in three private collections, or actually four private collections in Yemen. Um, and some, for those of you who don't know, Yemen is um, a place where there there's estimated to be about 50,000 codices that are in private homes. Very few of them have been cataloged, and an even smaller amount have been digitized. And uh, so this initiative involved a group of international scholars and librarians who worked with an existing local organization in Yemen called the Imam Zaid Foundation that had long been engaged in digitization. And uh, the NEH grant provided them with equipment, um, trained them in uh, international cataloging standards and digitization standards, um, and eventually the goal was to make these manuscripts available through Princeton University's digital library portal. And so um, it was a project that launched in 2013. It was a quite amazing cross-cultural collaboration. Um, but I should say that these uh, manuscripts, um, you know, I'm an art historian, uh, but these are not, you know, the kind of Islamic manuscripts that are illuminated in gold and have images of heroes shooting arrows off of horseback. Uh, these are very eclectic prod uh, products, um, some of which have been copied very recently, and they're uh, what my colleagues call library quality, not museum quality. Uh, and um, these are also um, uh, books that uh, my colleagues in religious studies have uh, spent a great deal of time with, and that is not the tradition that I come out of. I was much more interested in understanding these as material things, and also uh, trying to understand the circumstances of their digitization, which I came to understand were deeply embedded in these circumstances in Yemen today, which has become very, very divisive. Um, and uh, I'll just say very briefly that, um, you know, the uh, a kind of rise in interest in digitization in these particular manuscripts was also paired with the rise of the group uh, known as the Houthis or Ansar Allah, who uh, 
took the capital, Sana'a, in the year 2014, ousted the internationally recognized government, and then spurred on the beginning of a series of airstrikes in 2015 that were that was led by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Gulf allies, and also undergirded by logistic support by the United States, Britain, and France. Um, and so, you know, this kind of long story that I realized was really about the kind of linkage of the present with the past, um, and I realized that this kind of story that some of my colleagues don't like to tell because because they like to see the pre-modernists disconnected from the contemporary was one that very much needed to be told. Along with this, um, there's also a story about the remarkably constrained circumstances of dig digitization. And um, in this uh, conference, we've heard a lot about amazingly well-resourced projects. I think we need to also think about projects like this one, um, which took place um, in a situation which there were usually maybe like two or three hours of electricity a day, and when those hours of electricity were available was not made uh, public to anyone. It would come on and off as uh, 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 according to you know, who knows what logic. Um, and um, this kind of process of um, cross-cultural engagement, which I touted as a really amazing collaboration, was also, of course, one that was extremely encumbered, right? Um, that had to do with the implementation of this grant across lines that were very politically constrained. And so you know, things like buying equipment that was meant to land in Yemen was extremely difficult. Yemeni technicians who were supposed to come to the United States to be trained um, for digitization and in cataloging could not come to this country. And this is before the Muslim ban. This is in the year 2011, before um, you know, the current circumstances that we're dealing with. Um, when hard drives were supposed to be sent back, um, the uh, parcel delivery between the United States and Yemen was completely shut down because of a mail bomb that was sent in UPS that absolutely shut down any uh, ability to um, send those through mail. And so other arrangements had to be made. Um, cataloging, which I write about extensively in my essay, I won't talk about it today, um, and of course involved a great deal of translation. And in uh, the essay that I wrote, I talk about the metadata and I do some basic analysis about some of the uh, metadata from the MARC records that was computationally tractable, not all of it was. Um, and then after the start of the 2015 war, um, after the, uh, the materials were uploaded to Princeton, uh, all of the names of the owners of the collection had to be removed because it was feared that those collections might be targeted by airstrikes. And we have evidence that the coalition has been targeting sites that they've deemed to be ideologically problematic. And so those names were removed. Looting has also increased, so uh, that became another concern. Um, and and, uh, and even my communications with the uh, co colleagues in Yemen who were involved in this digitization process um, recently have had to be conducted over WhatsApp because we're, you know, their email is being watched. And um, you know, I'm just trying to really convey that these objects, the manuscripts themselves, as well as their digital facsimiles, are extremely politicized things. Right. Um, even if we have to sometimes work to uncover those circumstances of their politicization, it was not immediately obvious in this case. Um, and I also want to, and maybe this is not looking at all forward, but it's just taking stock of where we are now, to just bring to light the radically unequal circumstances um, that people are working with in the world of manuscript digitization. And I, um, you know, I'm sorry to bring such a kind of, um, you know, uh, very sad note at the end of this at this conference, but um, I think it's a, a perspective that. Uh, needs to be uh, included in this discussion. Thank you. Well, the two fundamental problems that we have right now, well, I should say three problems is, one is just basic sustainability. I look at all of the wonderful ideas about data here, but that requires people. And if you're going to have quality linked data, we need people. And it's extremely difficult to find that funding. So while we are able to raise the money to do the digitization projects in these endangered collections, to attract the types of scholars who are able to actually do the work is almost impossible from the standpoint of funding them. They're there, but getting there and trained is a big problem. The second problem is, a lot of these libraries give us these images but don't want to share them because of problems of the 19th century and 18th century. So we're able to put the images online, but the idea of offering those images through IIIF frameworks so that other institutions can use them is nearly impossible because the trust they gave us to preserve those images, and that's a major barrier 
for a lot of the discussions that we're talking about today. In fact, we're coming across that internally, even receiving you know, attacks against our site to kind of hack into it to download those, those images is becoming an increasing problem, particularly with regard to the Yemeni and Jerusalem and Iraqi and Syriac images. So that's a, a second problem. And then to be short, the third problem is um, we're kind of stuck in the NACO funnel too with regard to even creating authorities for other libraries to use. Um, we've done a, a recent audit for a major grant and nearly 60% of our authors and titles are not within the VIAF or LC system, <laughs> which means in order to even try to get them in so that other people can use them is going to be a major undertaking for us over the next couple of years. So beyond the logistics of doing the actual digital preservation, the internal problems uh, are a major problem for us uh, over the course of the next uh, five to 10 years. I think Nancy had a comment that I, I, I did want to say something that, that just you know about this kind of perennial question about how much technical knowledge do humanists need to have, um, because I think it's just one that you know we're always asking and it's always the one that we're going to be you know kind of struggling with. Um, and I, I think one of the ways to at least cope with it, you know, or to just at least think about it is that um, you know for me all technical work is intellectual work. Cleaning data is not mechanical work. That is intellectual work. Um, you know, Amen. programming is intellectual work, and that's how we have to think about it, so that we don't like somehow say, "Oh, I c I'm going to farm that out to someone who has the technical skill." Right. And so I think you know, if we, uh, you know, can just build a culture in which we're framing it like that, I think we will all be more powerful. And I think that the work that we um, that we do will hopefully be recognized in um, you know in a much more complete and um, uh, you know, comprehensive way, but I also think that, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about, as humanists, the technical skills that we lack, but we all, you know, we never talk about how much the technicians and, and the developers need our knowledge as well, right? Which, and I mean, there's some in the room, and they can, they can say, tell me if they, if they disagree with me, but, uh, you know, all of these projects, they could not have been done, obviously, without the humanists, and so that kind of back and forth, we're always kind of focusing on what humanists don't have, and indeed, we don't have a lot, and we, you know, we do need to, like, we, we need to work significantly to build up our our capacities, but at the same time, we also have to indicate how meaningful the work that we do is for the technical side, and how that's just not—that's not an add-on, that's not a bonus. It is um, absolutely integral to that kind of back and forth. And so, you know, the, yeah, I just wanted to add that. You know, I could build on yeah. that just really quickly, and on Dot's question of who the we is that we're talking about, um, I think it's easy to assume that other people are doing the technology. Uh, and that that is a barrier to participating in things like this. We've heard the question, how do you get started multiple times? Um, but you should always start, we should always start from a question, um, a, a need. So when Dot created um, the collation tool, it was from a need to create a, a better collation visualization. When Jeffrey created his wonderful series of, uh, of texts and related data, uh, it was from a question about trying to create a better um, uh, scholarly edition. Uh, none of these were sort of de novo ideas, uh, and they both then harnessed the technology and other technologists to produce what they've done. And so that, I think that's, as you're saying, building that community and really questioning the, the balkanization between technology and us mm -hmm. is important. I just want to second what Nancy said as a former dean. <clears throat> and it seems to me, and speaking here to the teaching faculty in the room here, because one of the real problems, of course, as you know, is that the kind of uh, technical programming, even editing work, uh, that is fundamental to this whole project that we've been talking about for these last few days, it, and its importance is not shared by a great many of our colleagues in various faculties, including the humanities faculty. And until you get to the point where a younger person who works on these projects, that their work is established and recognized uh, when it comes to tenure time and all the rest of that, um, we're not gonna get a lot, you know, you run up against a, a real wall. Um, and, uh, and that really seems to me to need a great deal of thought and a better, better rhetoric, a more persuasive uh, way of talking about this. And it isn't just for individual institutions. I mean, these are things that have to be also worked through our professional societies. 
to just simply get that kind of, of vocabulary out there. But it does mean talking to the deans and the provosts and all of that sort of thing, but starting with one's own colleagues. So another piece of this that we really haven't even gotten into today is that we're not just doing this work, cataloging digitization and creating, crafting discoverable clean metadata. We're not just doing it for ourselves and for our students and for other scholars. We're doing it for the public, uh, especially the open access piece. And when you see what's happening in medieval studies today and how the Middle Ages is being misread and misinterpreted and misappropriated, it, it means that it's really incumbent on us to educate outside of academia. And we have a real opportunity with this kind of work, with Bibliophily, with the public outreach that you do, Dot with your videos, and Nick with his blog, and with um, the way you bring kids in to look at manuscripts. It's a really, really incredibly important opportunity to teach the people the, the reality of the Middle Ages as opposed to the, the sort of fake medieval, medievalist, medievalism Middle Ages that people are getting. And I think we always have to keep that, uh, we always have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, to, the, to the panelists and also to, to all the presenters over the past two days. Um, I guess my question is kind of a general one, and it's sort of open to, to anyone, really. But um, you know, I think about the technological revolution of print in the 15th century and how that might have changed some of the uh, kind of questions that the first humanists were asking maybe in the 15th century. And in fact, some of the questions they, they were asking about um, the credit, you know, the reliability of texts actually predate uh, and kind of come before the print revolution. And I'm just wondering about the current digital revolution or maybe we're beyond the revolution at this point, but how does it, how has it affected the humanistic questions we're actually asking? And are those questions still really driving the technology? or the technological changes, um, and to what extent are the sort of the chicken and the egg, you know, are the, are the, are the, are the, are, are questions prompting new technologies or are the new technologies themselves influencing the questions we ask? And I don't, I don't ask that in any kind of loaded way. I'm just interested in, in hearing what you have to say about that. I mean, I just have um, a thought. I, I just sort of mentioned it in passing, very brief, that I think the print medium has certainly affected our appreciation of histories in particular ways. So, you know, the medium is the message, I guess. Uh, the medium does affect consciousness. So the the, the difficulties of, of printing a large-scale scholastic edition throughout the 20th century have been expensive and difficult. And they've led to an interpretation of the scholastic history that is punctuated by um, what have been interpreted as great lights, such that one can tell the story of scholasticism with three figures, Aquinas, Scotus, and Occam. And maybe if you want to add Gabriel Beale, the fourth, but Gabriel Beale lived 200 years later. And, uh, um, and part of that has to do with the medium, that um, it's very difficult to access all of these smaller orbiting people. Uh, if we, we want to teach a class, we have to teach things in translation. What are we going to teach is it's uh, all of these little things are not accessible. They can't be translated. So the, the story of medieval philosophy gets told with four great thinkers. And they're in understood as independent geniuses who have thought in a vacuum right, and then um, have uh, come up with these. And um, you know the idea of being able to experience text in nonlinear ways um, in kind of hierarchies that cut across each other, I think will have the effect of changing that story. It's a, a different consciousness, a different conscious idea of what it means to write in the Middle Ages, what it means to think in the Middle Ages. And so um, to the answer to my question is, is both. I think that um, certainly our existing questions are driving new technological tools and innovations, but I think many things I do are are driven by, well, I could do that. 
right? And uh, sometimes, well, that would be cool, let me try that. And I think that should be encouraged just as well because it's precisely in that moment that you start to see something in a way you didn't before. Not an answer per se, but a follow-up question on who is leading research in terms of if we can go back to meaning description digitization a little bit, not description. It's a shame that Christoph left because he said something very significant that in 16 years, only 25% of the manuscripts have been digitized and put online. So, and across the board, there are very few institutions who have been able to digitize all of their manuscripts at once and put them in an online repository, right? So, I would like to hear any comments on this, really, from anybody. Um. I think the possibility of digitizing every manuscript is is not. I don't think I don't think it's impossible. I think that, <coughs> but I think digitizing archives is absolutely impossible. Um, and I think that I think that uh, I think that our archival friends, when we talk about when we talk about the state of digitization. Uh, the manuscript people are, in, are maybe it's only 25%, but, but compare, the archive people are in a, they're still dark, the lights are still out. And, uh, and they will be for a very, very long time. Yeah. I think an important, we, is this, is this working? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's important to, when we talk about how much manuscript codices, you know, collections there are that still need to be done. We, I think we talk a lot about the haves and the have nots, and, and I know that we certainly do it here, and like, how are we gonna pay for it? But then there's the, the other piece, which is, which we've also touched on actually with, um, with uh, Nancy's talk, is the sort of the human side of it. And that is a, a big thing to sort of overcome and work through, and Himmel has done a really excellent job of, of making some of that work happen. But just, and there, again, like I don't have an answer, but just that this is like a constant thing that we have to, that we have to think about. Um, and it's one thing to you know, get a big grant and digitize all the medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia. Um, and it's a whole other thing to say, well, now we're gonna go to Italy and we're gonna digitize all the little, even if we had the money, like getting agreements from all the little places in Italy, let alone any other country is, you know, is a really, um, is a really hard thing and it's not technical and it's not funding, it's just <coughs> cultural and, and human, the human part of it. I'm not necessarily interested in the numbers, I'm interested in what has been digitized actually now since like driving research. Yes, oh, I see your point. Yeah. About what gets to be digitized yeah. and Mm -hmm. in different contexts that have more resources to put this together yep. instead of going to smaller libraries in Italy. Yeah, there's so much that just isn't getting studied because there's, not, there's no access. Self-perpetuating, yeah. Well, it's self-perpetuating or it's a new canon. I mean, hmm. yeah. I, yeah, you know, and I'm, I, I'm not sure which it is, but. But I don't think anyone's making any like conscious decisions about it. It's just, you know, there are opportunities that come up Right. Right. But maybe so we need to be. Maybe we just need to start being conscious of it. Yes. And and, yeah. and you know, yeah. so realizing that that's happening. So I do think that people are making conscious decisions. I mean, I think, for example, that the um, that the Germans are consciously digitizing all the German manuscripts. Uh, <laughs> I think that I think that when it comes to digitization in America. Um, people on grant giving panels make a lot of the decisions, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is great. Um, but I do think that the things that get digitized are, are still very largely based upon national boundaries. Um, and it would be lovely to, I mean, eCodices for all its merits is a classic example. Um, I do think that it would be lovely to think that we could think of 
collections in a completely different way. And I think that IIIF and things like the Scholarly Commentaries Text Archive allow us to th think in those terms, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. so, so am I next? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a different question um, to Ben and to uh, the Hill Manuscript as well? Both mentioned sustainability, uh, the, how do we sustain the, um, the projects that are going on. And Mike, my question is for you guys is, what do you think this is a, a technological problem uh, that needs to be solved, or do you think it's a, a social problem born of a momentous uh, cultural shift that will, in a sense, inevitably work itself out? Uh, by that I mean, I mean, how many times has this building been renovated? <laughs> right. The idea that we're going to build something that doesn't need constant maintenance is just not thinking correctly about what we're building. Um, so. But we don't see the kind of investment in in the in the in the archives and the things you can't touch that institutions and universities are putting into buildings, and I think it's inevitable that we will continue to make this information, and inevitably we will continue. Uh, or I'm I'm asking, will it, is it inevitable that as this cultural shift unfolds, will again eventually this money will eventually start shifting? to the maintenance of these kinds of things uh, and shifting away from uh, these kinds of buildings. I, I just constantly hear this objection that a book you know, will be there forever, and that's just such a false lie. Go put it outside, and it'll be gone in just, in just as quick a time as some a URL, right? Uh, I just don't think we have the kind of institutional investment in what we do, and I'm wondering if that's just a product of uh, we're in the process of a cultural shift. Um, I'll jump in and then hand over. Um, I think that's what I meant, Jeff, by saying that this is a curatorial and library problem uh, that we're not dealing with yet. So um, yes, things are changing. Things are changing massively. Uh, we are not changing quickly with them. And so one of the questions that I'm always left with is for a project like yours, we can preserve the bits, um, but we can't necessarily preserve all of the mappings that you produce and that sort of thing. Um, so we may wind up with a, a Jeff Witt beehive in uh, a couple of decades <laughs> that somebody can build a PhD on. Um, um, I mean, uh, that may be. Um, I think that uh, you know, in the past 10 years, technology, if people have been paying attention, it's how we even make websites is so radically shifted that uh, the sustainability of even the mappings of what I've created is far superior than what what most people see is a website that I've created, and that's the most ephemeral part of what I've what I've worked on. So yeah, uh, you know I've built that 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 website that visualization three times. I'll build it three more times, but every time I build it, I build it faster, and I I uh, and it's not because the other one wasn't sustained; it's because I want to add more to it. So. Um, that may be, and but, but my point too, it may be a beehive, but my point is that we're now in the moment where we are inventing what we want. So the idea that I'm making something crazy that's going to be the beehive is like, maybe, but that's, that's the moment in history that we are. Um, we're inventing what we want, and the idea that 30 years from now we've superseded that is only possible because we, uh, we, are, we are doing these processes. So, yeah, uh, I'd like to hear what you want to say. I suppose on the positive side of it, I had a recent conversation with uh, three major funders. I'm not going to name them, but uh, and I we made very strong arguments to them that they need to move beyond the problem of giving grants for the building of a project and build into the grants the maintenance funds for the project goes on. Yeah. That is that is an essential. We've been making that very, very powerful argument to them, largely because updating the underlying software is a lot easier if you have the maintenance funds than to try to reinvent it every 10 years, which is yeah. a complete. I also want to make a nod to Doug Emery here, who's gave me the great quote about uh, the data is greater than the interface because in many respects, that's the really underlying thing that we got to keep solid, because you can always move to another interface, but if your data is bad or problematic, that makes it a lot worse. But I would, there is a practical reality that affects us 
significantly, and it affects many institutions in here, which is that the cost of producing the digital technology is higher and higher. And as we keep investing more dollars into technology, that could and oftentimes leads into less positions and staff in a library. So we had five librarians cut from our position because they're investing more and more into technology. And with them, you're losing tons of knowledge too. So the balance that has to be struck in this is not just simply a maintenance issue, but also re recovering and maintaining the, the, the staff to actually keep it going. And I think states, institutions, granting organizations need to really start investing in people, not just the technology. I totally agree, but I also think that, for example, Penn invests a lot in its digitization. Um, but the digitization cost of digitizing unique assets that are in Philadelphia and at Penn <laughs> is as nothing. It's a rounding error compared to what we pay Elsevier. And we pay Elsevier for exactly the same stuff that Princeton pays Elsevier for. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is the economics of the generation and, uh, and the capitalism of um, just the market of knowledge. Um, has to carry on changing, and we have to drive it, and especially if we want to keep the data open. Um, oh. yeah. I actually had an observation, is that okay? <laughs> um, it's just that my mind keeps going back to Ellie's clock and Nick's question about Ellie's clock um, of did they try and hide the maintenance and the work that went into the upkeep? and sort of a lot of the comments have been about you maybe don't need to learn Sparkle, but you need to know how the data works and all of this. And this sort of making things apparent, showing, showing, making it evident how many people it's going to take to keep this up and maintain this over time and making that all visible is also very much part of these projects and perhaps in the interfaces as you link out to Sparkle, as you sort of force people engaging with things to see what's behind the wheel, um, that, that could be part of the way forward and making funders quite aware of the maintenance and the people moving the clock mechanisms. Okay. Um. That observation, that wonderful observation, brings to a close the 12th annual symposium, Schoenberg Symposium. <laughs> <laughs>